Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the annual lecture of Philosophy East West, organized in collaboration with Pakhuis de Zwijger. My name is Natasha van der Berg, and I have the honor to be your host tonight. And tonight's lecture, the annual lecture, is given by David Loy, a prominent Buddhist philosopher, author of several influential books like Money, Sex, War, and Karma, Notes from a Buddhist Revolution, A New Buddhist Path, and Ecodharma. And let me say a few words about the foundation philosophy East-West. It is dedicated to promoting and developing philosophizing across borders, to introduce and share traditions of philosophy movements from all over the world and explore the connections with Western thinking. Philosophy East West organizes seminars, reading groups, workshops for high school teachers, meetings, and of course, this annual lecture. And there is also a podcast, which is only in Dutch. It's called Lijfspraak. Yeah, the translation is really strange because it would be something like The Body Talks or something. Uh, but you can if you, if you are able to speak Dutch, you can listen to it. And if you want to know more about what the activities of these foundations are, you can register, register yourself for the mailing list or sp speak to, after this event, uh, Wiebe, where are you? In the front row. Wiebe, you have to stand up so everybody can see you. This is Wiebe. Uh, and next to him is Feriel Saatchi. Next to him, and you can talk to them uh, if they want know, to know more about the foundation. Okay. It's the policy of Pakhuis de Zwijger to make events like these uh, free of charge, because we want people to come regardless of their financial position. But we invite everybody else who is able to, to make a small contribution to cover the costs. And both the people of Pakhuis de Zwijger and uh, Philosophy East West would be most grateful if you would do so. And for that, we have something really uh, disruptive, innovative. We have a QR code. It's not on there, but it's everywhere else. And there is a QR code. It's gone. Uh, but uh, if you use it, you can you come on the right uh, page of Pakhuis de Zwijger and you make a small contribution if you have the financial means to do so. Feel free if you if you think this is not for me. Okay. And now um, let's start the evening. And in the spirit of Buddhism, we start with a brief meditation. The purpose is to come to rest and find peace of mind. I ask you all for five minutes of silence, a brief moment to arrive in the here and now with your body, mind and soul at this event tonight. So relax. And let's enjoy and embrace the silence.
Thank you. Please join me in welcoming to the stage the lecturer of tonight. Give him a warm welcome here in Amsterdam, David Loy. First of all, can you hear me okay? Let me begin by thanking the Institute for the honor of this invitation. Uh, I'm truly delighted to be here, and I'm also very aware that any such event requires quite a bit of work by a number of people, so thanks to all of you. And thanks to those of you who have come this evening because the topic that I want to talk about uh, is sometimes uncomfortable. Sometimes it's something that we don't want to think about. Also, there may be some ambiguity about what I am going to talk about, uh, because you may have noticed that the title is somewhat different than the description. Did anybody notice that? Yes? So, what I will be talking about is ecodharma. That is to say, a, I, I will be offering a Buddhist perspective on the ecological crisis. And every day, I am reminded of something that Noam Chomsky mentioned recently in an interview he said, we are now living in the most dangerous moment in human history. This is the most dangerous time in the history of our species. He said this during COVID, um, but he didn't refer to COVID. That wasn't one of the things he was worried about. He's concerned about nuclear weapons, He's concerned about the rise of authoritarianism, the fact that so many, plan, um, so many democratic societies are becoming authoritarian. But the first thing he mentioned, and I think his main concern, and our main concern, is the climate crisis. Actually, I don't like to talk about the climate because it seems to me it's really just the tip of an iceberg. So often when people talk about climate, uh, they think that if we can just shift away from fossil fuels to renewable sources of energy, if we can do it quickly enough, then our civilization can go on as it has been. And as you may already know, something like that really isn't possible. The crisis we are facing is much deeper. Ecologically, we also have, for example, loss of biodiversity, the fact that so many plant and animal species are disappearing. Uh, there are so many types of pollution uh, in the water, in the sea, uh, in the land, in our bodies, uh, topsoil in many agricultural regions is disappearing, it's being eroded away, and so forth. You can probably add your own concern to this list. But basically what it means is we have a crisis. There's a crisis in our civilization's relationship to the natural world.
we seem to be a civilization that has lost its way. And there's a certain kind of irony in the fact that just when we have sort of achieved a truly global civilization, our civilization seems to be self-destructing. I'm reminded of a couple Zen stories, little dialogues. In one of them, a student asked the master, what should we do when difficult times come? And the master answered, welcome. Our path is not about avoiding difficult times. In fact, often that's when the greatest, the deepest transformation occurs. And there's another story with uh, Chan Master Yun Men. His student asked him, um, what is the fruit of a lifetime of practice? In other words, what do we learn from all of these years and years of meditation and so forth? And he replied simply, responding appropriately. That's all. We learn to respond appropriately in any situation. That's actually very significant in avoiding the problem that many religions fall into, where we see our ultimate goal as somehow transcending or escaping this world. He's saying our path makes us more intimate with our situation so that we can respond appropriately to it. But how do we respond appropriately to the greatest challenge, the greatest, most dangerous time that we have ever experienced? And can Buddhism, can Buddhist teachings and practices help us do that? Well, one possible answer is no. I mean, if you think about it, the Buddha lived in Iron Age India maybe 2,400 years ago. He didn't know anything about carbon emissions or loss of biodiversity. And likewise, for all of the Buddhist traditions that developed in other parts of Asia, all of them were pre-modern. None of them was facing the kind of challenge we face today. And yet, and you knew this and yet was coming, um, there are really important sort of implications in Buddhist teachings that we can tease out. And what I'd like to do this evening is to focus on the one that frankly seems to me the most important of all. It's what we call the Bodhisattva path. And maybe I can do a little reality check here. Can I ask how many of you are familiar with the concept of the Bodhisattva path? Thank you, that's helpful to me. Basically, in, in Buddhism, it's the idea that the goal of our practice is not simply our own enlightenment, our own awakening, but that ultimately the goal is to help everyone else awaken as well. So what I'd like to do is focus on three aspects of that bodhisattva path, and I want to call it the new bodhisattva path, because as you will see, I think that we need to understand it in a somewhat different way. And in fact, some people now are talking about the ecosattva path, focusing on the response to the ecological crisis. The first aspect I would like to talk about is the fact that bodhisattvas always have a double practice. It's like the two sides of a coin, or I guess the two sides of a hand. On the one hand, they continue to work on their own personal spiritual development. That is to say, if it's probably some form of meditation or mindfulness. Uh, there's a great variety of practices in the different Buddhist traditions. But they know that that's insufficient. In addition to that focus on their own spiritual development, they also are socially engaged. They realize that it's really important to be out there helping other people. And it's not simply a matter that those two practices go well together. What I want to emphasize is, in fact, they depend on each other to be as successful as we need them to be. For example, I'm familiar, and maybe you're familiar, with some social or ecological activists. And it's a, it's a very difficult path, uh, very frustrating, because many times you are not as successful as you would like to be. Sometimes it's very hard to avoid burnout, anger, 
so how wonderful it can be if you can ground your ecological engagement in some kind of practice that helps provide a sort of stable foundation that gives you equanimity, serenity of the sort that we were, the, the quietness, the stillness that we were cultivating for the five minutes at the beginning here. This can be really important for activists to help them cope with, I think, what is really a very difficult role. But it also works the other way around. in a kind of interesting way, because if we think about why we come to Buddhist practice, almost always it's because there's something wrong with our lives, there's something missing, something isn't quite right, something isn't working. And we realize that we sort of need to go within to find out what that is and to transform ourselves. I mean, why else would we spend all of this time, energy, money, sitting on our bottoms, uh, sore legs, sore backs, etc., etc.? So inevitably, at the beginning, there's a certain kind of self-preoccupation, which is natural. We want to resolve this personal problem. But here's the interesting thing. As we continue our Buddhist practice, what we start to realize is that at the heart, at the core of our problem, is our own self-preoccupation. The delusion, as we say, the delusion of a sense of self that is separate from other people whose well-being is separate from the well-being of other people. In other words, as we practice, there's slowly this realization that focusing on my own enlightenment is, or my own peace of mind, uh, at a certain point, we realize that's part of the problem, that we need to become engaged because that's how we become less self-preoccupied. I remember when I started Zen practice many years ago, uh, it was in a rather unconventional Zen center in Hawaii. Uh, and it was quite, quite wonderful. We, we sat very hard. Uh, we did a lot of meditation. And what you might call openings, insights, tiny glimpses of enlightenment, they were not that uncommon. But what I realized, and what I think just about everyone realized, was that that was not so difficult, but what was more challenging was integrating that into how we actually live in the world, how we actually engage with other people. I'm reminded of something Ram Das um, said. So, you think you're enlightened, huh? Well, go spend the holidays with your relatives. <laughs> I think you get the point there, right? I mean, the basic issue is the idea that somehow, and there's still a lot of resistance to this in the Buddhist world, believe me. Uh, people still think that the real practice is the meditation, the going within, and somehow social engagement is sort of a distraction from that. And I think what we need to realize is, especially at this point, facing the truly critical situation we are, we need to realize that actually our engagement is not a distraction from the practice, it's a different kind of practice. And it's essential, especially at this particular point, in some ways, maybe more essential. Because that's when we transform our usual self-preoccupied habits and actually try to integrate a kind of focus on compassion and regard for other people and indeed regard for the earth. Within the Buddhist world, and maybe I shouldn't presume this is the case here in, in the Netherlands, but certainly in, in the United States, there's, I think we sometimes have a kind of romantic myth about practice. Uh, maybe following the example of the great Tibetan yogi Milarepa, who uh, supposedly he sequestered himself in a remote cave, meditated for many, 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 many years, his skin 
turned green from eating nettles. That's the, that's the story anyway. Uh, and supposedly he went all the way to Buddhahood in one lifetime. And so there's a kind of romantic myth, you know, if we really sit hard enough that we might be able to do something like that. But I'm very struck by something Joanna Macy said. She said, the world has a role to play in our awakening. Engagement in the world's problems, therefore, we really need to understand it as not an evasion of our own individual practice, but really an essential part of it. And as we could say, the person who benefits most from the engagement of the bodhisattva, the bodhisattva's engagement in the world, is the bodhisattva herself. And as one of the great Japanese Buddhist teachers, uh, Kukai, also known as Kobodaishi, uh, he said, the measure of our enlightenment is how we serve others. And this really fits in very well with one of my all-time favorite quotations, actually not by a Buddhist, but by a Vedanta teacher from India, Nisargadatta. He really summed it up so beautifully when he said, when I look inside and see that I am nothing, that's wisdom. When I look outside and see that I am everything, that's love. Between these two, my life flows. Isn't that lovely? Yeah. Wisdom and love, or as we more often say in Buddhism, wisdom and compassion, the two pillars of the Buddhist path. And he shows the relationship between them. Wisdom is the realization of our non-duality, our non-separation from other people. And love, it's not a, a feeling, but it's a way of being, it's a way of engaging with people that integrates that wisdom, that insight into how we actually live in the world. Franz Kafka the Czech writer, in a, in a letter, he said, you can hold yourself back from the sufferings of the world. That is something you are free to do. But perhaps your very holding back is the one suffering you could avoid. We can hold back from the sufferings of the world, from the sufferings of other people, but that reinforces the sense of separation, whereas the emphasis in the Buddhist traditions is the realization whereby we let go of ourselves. We realize our non-duality, our intimacy. Not to do that, to keep the sense of separation, is a kind of suffering that we can avoid by, in fact, letting go of ourselves and engaging with others. Does that make any sense? That's the first point I want to make, the emphasis on the double practice of a bodhisattva, the fact that they have their own meditation, whatever that may be, but they also see that the engagement in the world is essential to their own transformation. And I think if Chomsky is right, and I think he is, that this is the most dangerous moment in human history, clearly we need a practice, we need a path that emphasizes engagement with it. The second point speaks to why I talk about the new bodhisattva path, because I think we can understand it in a somewhat different way than Buddhists historically have. I think we can understand, in particular, what the problem is, right? For Buddhism, the most important concept of all is dukkha, which we usually translate into English as suffering. But we have to understand that in the broadest possible sense, not just physical and mental pain, but also discomfort, disease, frustration, anxiety, or my favorite, dis-ease. 
This was truly the most important concept. The Buddha himself emphasized that all he had to teach was dukkha and how to end it. But traditionally in Buddhism, this is so often, not always, but usually understood in a very individualistic sort of fashion, right? So each of us, we have our own karma, and our own karma uh, leads to certain types of events happening to us and certain types of suffering. And I think we're in a situation now where we can understand this dukkha in a more profound way, in a more institutionalized way. Another way to say it is that, according to Buddhism, the problems occur when we are motivated by what are called the three poisons, greed, ill will, delusion. When what we do is motivated by them, it tends to create problems for ourselves and very likely for other people as well. What I think we can see today, however, is that greed, ill will, delusion, usually understood in an individual fashion, that they have now become institutionalized. They have become, what, structuralized? They are part of our civilizational structure. Uh, we don't have time to go into great detail, but in particular, if greed means that you never have enough, I think that's a pretty good description of our economic system. Um, consumers never consume enough. In fact, to be frank, it seems to me that consumerism is the real most popular religion of our era, of our time. If we understand um, a religion, if a religion is what teaches us what's really important about the world and how to live in it, the reality is most of the time for us, right? It's, let's be honest, it's some form of consumerism, right? But this issue of greed... It's not only consumerism, we can think about the way the institutions work, like corporations. Um, corporations, they're never profitable enough. Um, their stock price never high enough, market share never big enough. Every nation is preoccupied with collective GNP, GDP. It's got to keep growing, right? The emphasis on more and more, which raises this interesting question, why is more and more always better if it can never be enough. What do I mean by saying that we have institutionalized greed? Well, consider for a moment, suppose you are the CEO of a fossil fuel corporation, and one night you have a kind of enlightenment and you realize that uh, it's really essential to convert as quickly as possible to renewable sources of energy because the carbon is destroying the climate and so forth, right? So uh, I think that's a kind of insight that most of us would approve of. But what happens if you actually try to put that into effect in your job as the CEO? What I'm pointing at is that if it's the case that trying to restructure the company is going to reduce corporate profits, what's going to happen? I think it's kind of obvious, right? Sooner or later, probably sooner, you will lose your position. You will be fired because you're having this effect on profits and you will be replaced by somebody else who does a better job of maximizing profits. All of which means then that the problem here is not greedy individuals. The problem is a system that in fact uses people in a certain way and if they don't play their function within that system then they will be replaced by somebody else who does, right? So here's the challenge. We have not only the traditional Buddhist challenge of understanding and addressing our own individual greed, ill will, delusion, but we also now have to find ways to uh, address and challenge the institutionalized greed of corporations. I'm not going to go into examples of uh, institutionalized ill will and delusion. We could look at that too, but really there's not time for that. Um, but I think you can see my point here. And one of the really important implications for Buddhism is that what it means is that we need stronger communities because 
addressing these larger social problems isn't something that we can do just as individuals, right? In Buddhism, we talk about the three jewels or the three gems, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And we can say in the West, we have a lot of teachers, we have a lot of teachings, but where we are often deficient, at least in the United States where I come from, is the problem of Sangha, that is to say community. I certainly see this in Zen, where maybe we come together, we do a retreat, but it's all quiet. It's all in silence, unless the master gives a talk or maybe there's a one-on-one -on -one with the teacher. You're sitting quietly together the whole time, and maybe you have a little tea and a chat with your neighbor at the very end, but that's not going to work. That's not sufficient, frankly. We're going to have to find ways to bring ourselves together, to work together, first of all, to cope with the difficult times that are coming, but also to challenge the kind of institutionalized problems, such as the institutionalized greed that I'm trying to talk about. Bill McKibben, uh, an important American environmentalist, he was the founder of 350.org. When he was in Paris for the climate talks a few years ago, somebody asked him, what can I do as an individual? And he replied, well, stop being an individual, right? That's not to say that we don't need to reduce our own carbon footprint with solar panels and electric cars and that, but it's not enough. I think sometimes the fossil fuel corporations have done a pretty good job of persuading us that the problem is individual and we have to reduce our carbon footprint. In reality, it's much more systemic and we have to find ways to challenge what they are doing. It seems to me that American Buddhism in the last generation or so has, become, has done a very good job, and maybe the same thing has happened here, very good job about uh, becoming more socially engaged but it's still very much on the level of individuals helping individuals. So, uh, homeless kitchens. Uh, we have prison dharma where meditation teachers go into prisons to uh, teach the inmates how to meditate. We have hospices. We have a number of Zen hospices where uh, they are there to help people at the end of their life. But again, it's individuals helping individuals. To use a metaphor here, I think that in the last generation or so, we have become much better at uh, pulling drowning people out of the river. But what we have to do is start asking, why are there so many more drowning people in the river? Who or what is pushing them in the river upstream? And there's one more quick economic point that I want to add here, which is to, and maybe this is a reflection or, or a deference to the original title. I think it's also important for us to realize that the ecological crisis is also a class crisis. What do I mean by that? Well, let me just give you one quick example. In the years 1990, to 2015, right, 25 year period, very critical period when we could have done so much, but we didn't, right? During that period, the wealthiest 1% of the world's population, the 1%, the top, they were responsible for twice the carbon emissions, twice the carbon emissions of the bottom 50% of humanity. Please think for a moment what that implies. What does that really mean in terms of uh, reflecting the way that our economic system and, and the, the resistance of our economic system, the, the impact that that's having in keeping us from doing what we all know is necessary. That's the second point. The third point, the third aspect of the new bodhisattva or ecosattva path, the one that in fact is of most interest to me, 
is the fact that the bodhisattva path doesn't tell us what to do, but it tells us how to do it. It tells us a lot about how to do it. Um, and again, that, that makes sense in terms of you know, remembering what I said at the beginning, that um, the Buddha lived in a very different time and place, so we can't go back to the original Pali Canon or the Mahayana Sutras. We're not going to find answers to the specifics of what it is that we need to do. But the Bodhisattva path does tell us a lot about however it is that we apply whatever we choose to do. I'm coming to you from Boulder, Colorado. Um, and we have, in addition to an eco-dharma center that we started up in the mountains, we have various eco-dharma groups. And it's interesting to see different people doing different things. Uh, one of my friends is a retired banker. Uh, he's also a Zen teacher, by the way, now. Uh, but as a retired banker, he goes to Washington. And he has a very special skill that I don't have. He knows how to talk to Republicans. And I think he's quite good at it, you know. And he works, he lobbies for a carbon tax. Um, other people, I have one of my Ecodharma friends who, when, when my wife and I bought a new house, they helped us do an energy audit and solar panels and that sort of thing. Um, in my own case, I have a bit of a background as a kind of, um, well, when I was young, I was an anti-Vietnam activist. Um, so I have some fondness for nonviolent civil disobedience. And I have to say, I've rather enjoyed chaining myself to the front of a bank uh, that is funding fossil fuel corporations and, and that sort of thing. As a member of Extinction Rebellion, we also blockaded a road. Well, that was maybe less, uh, less successful. But the fundamental idea that nonviolent uh, action can be, I mean, I think that there, there's a real point to that in certain contexts. And so we can ask, which of those is a Buddhist activity? I think all of them, and no doubt many others as well, but Buddhism doesn't really give us the specifics, and indeed, I think, given our unique situation, it may well be that each of us individually has to decide for ourselves, work that out. But what I want to focus on and end on is one particular aspect of bodhisattva engagement, which I think is absolutely essential, but also very easy to misunderstand. Bodhisattvas act without attachment to the results of their actions. They act without attachment. In the Pali Canon, which is, um, the, includes the earliest Buddhist text that we have, uh, the Buddha himself said that the actions of an awakened person are nirasa, which can be translated as without expectation or even sometimes without hope. And it's interesting, this isn't just Buddhism too. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the Hindu text, the Bhagavad Gita, maybe the most important Hindu text. Uh, one of the interesting things about that text, or the main thing it's doing, it's talking about different paths to God, different yogas, they're called, different... Uh, spirit, different kinds of spiritual practice. And one of the main ones is called karma yoga because karma literally means action. So karma yoga is the path of action. And it also says very specifically that karma yoga... Well, let me read it so I don't garble it here. Your right is to the work, never to the fruits. Your right, your responsibility is to do the work, not to receive the fruits of it. A very good way to cut through greed, needless to say. But the implications are much broader than that. However, action without attachment to result, there's, there's also a kind of danger built into that in the sense that it's easy to misunderstand especially because Buddhism emphasizes so much intention, our, our motivations. In fact, that was the Buddha's real contribution to uh, the understanding of karma. 
that uh, at the time, at, at his time, karma would tended to be understood somewhat mechanically, and the Buddha said, no, you know, what creates karma is your intentional actions. And it's easy to conclude from that then that what's really important is the purity of your motivation. It doesn't matter whether what you do makes any difference or has any effect whatsoever. It just, how pure are you in, in, in your motivation? And I think that's a really serious misunderstanding because that implies a kind of a casual attitude that I think you can see probably nothing much is going to come of it. So let me just uh, try to unpack a little bit more what it means to act without attachment to result. Because this, to me, is so much at the heart of the issue, right? One example that I find very helpful is comparing a 100-meter dash with running a marathon. When you run a 100-meter dash, the only thing that matters is getting to the end as quickly as possible, right? You don't have time to, anything, to think about anything else besides that. But needless to say, you can't run a marathon that way, right? You'll burn yourself out really quickly and so much for the race. When you run a marathon, you have to pace yourself. But not only that, my friends who run marathons, and I depend on them because I'm not a marathon runner, but they say when you're running the marathon, you actually can't focus on the result, that that sort of disorients you. What's really important is to focus on where you are, just this step, just this step. In Japanese, we have a term for it, tada, just this. And they say that's really the essential point. Of course, you're, you're, you're running in a certain direction. You're not, you know, you're not running all over the place or sitting by the side of the road. But nonetheless, you're focused on right here, right now. And if you continue to run in that direction, you will eventually get to the goal. Right? In other words, you don't really have to think or even worry about the goal. The action of just this right here, right now will take you there sooner or later by itself. And it's interesting, if you think about Buddhist practice, I think we can see the connection here, because Buddhist practice, what is it doing? Well, it's constantly bringing us back to the here and now. So we're not off fantasizing about where we want to be or what's going to happen in the future. You know, the meditation, here, now. But what about a practice that's, or what about a race that has no end? I'm thinking in particular uh, about a certain kind of orientation. In Zen tradition, uh, in all the Zendos that I've practiced in, uh, every day, at least once a day, we would recite what are called the, uh, the, the Bodhisattva vows. And the first of which says, living beings are numberless, I vow to save them all. If you think about that a little bit, it's kind of odd. We are promising to do something that we can't possibly achieve. What's the point of that? The point is the fact that it's not, again, it's not about attachment to results. It's not about attaining a particular goal. What's important is a reorientation in the meaning of my life away from our usual preoccupation with what's in it for me to what can I do to make the world a better place for all of us. That the vow cannot be fulfilled is exactly the point, you see. That there's no end to this practice. There's no end to this. It's, if we apply it to some kind of social engagement, say ecological, um, Maybe there's some particular project we're engaged in, and we're successful, fine. Does that mean we're done? I mean, there's always more that needs to be done. And if we're not successful, well, then we have to find other ways to do it, or maybe we have to shift our focus altogether. But the point here is that this is the sort of process that has no end, and that's what's really wonderful about it, that this is a reorientation in the meaning of our life, that uh, we will never get bored. Right? We will never be finished with it, and nor do we want to be finished with it. Right? 
And it's interesting that someone who has volunteered for this kind of job, as it were, if you want to call it a job, such a person won't be intimidated by challenges that sometimes appear hopeless. And that brings us back to the ecological crisis. Let's be honest. The ecological crisis looks very difficult. I think you all know this. And privately, sometimes publicly, there are climate scientists who fear that we have already passed tipping points or we are so close to them that they are inevitable. And they believe, an increasing number of people believe, that civilization as we now know it uh, can't, cannot continue indefinitely. It's difficult to anticipate what is going to happen or what might happen, but it doesn't look good. When it comes to the future, we can see certain factors that make us very concerned, but we don't know how they're going to play out. And I guess that's the point. Huh? We don't know. We just don't know. The irony is that in Buddhism, and especially emphasized in Zen, don't know mind is something really important. Whereas we might think don't know would be, there would be something disempowering about it. In fact, in Buddhism, it's something that we emphasize. There's a famous story of a student who was on pilgrimage, and the master whom he visited, why are you going about on pilgrimage? And the student reflected for a while, and he said, I don't know. And the master said, ah, not knowing is most intimate. The not knowing here refers to a kind of openness, you know, a, a, and a, and a way of escaping dogmatism, a flexibility whereby we do the very best we can in any particular situation, but we know that uh, our understanding is limited and we may, we may well need to change what we do as, our un, as the situation changes or as our understanding of the situation changes. Right? We become more spacious, you could say, more aware of our own reactivity and more open to the perspectives of others. So it's not so much a fixed position but a way of engaging with the world just as it is right here and now without sort of dogmat dogmatically, ah, this is the way it is. One of my teachers, Robert Aiken, liked to say, our path isn't about clearing up the mystery. It's about making the mystery clear. In, Zen pract in Buddhist practice, it's not about, you know, we have an experience, ah, oh, now I understand everything. <laughs> no, it's the opposite. It's sort of letting go and in a way, the mystery is clear, and it, you could say the mystery takes us. We open up to this, something beyond what we can understand conceptually, something that we never grasp, but something that grasps us. When we apply this to ecological activism, I think it's really important to emphasize that this implies... avoiding the common dualisms that we tend to fall into when we think about the ecological situation. I'm thinking of optimism, pessimism, right? Or even better examples, hope and despair. It's interesting that these are dualisms where you, they always come together. You can't have one without the other. As I like to say about optimism or pessimism, a pessimist is somebody who has had to live with an optimist. You know, and even more so with hope and despair, they feed on each other. You can say each is the denial of the other. Joanna Macy, one of my uh, heroes, says, and I quote, I find that assuring people there's hope, including myself, is not all that useful. In Buddhism, there's no word for hope. I think what she's really referring to there is, 
if you read the Buddha Sutras, they don't talk about hope. Hope isn't the issue. Hope would be viewed as a distraction from what's at hand. It takes you out of the present moment and into conjecture. I think all we can really affirm is where we want to put our attention. We have a choice. Do we want to give up and surrender to the great unraveling? Or do we want to join those working for a livable future? Since the outcome is uncertain, I'm still quoting Joanna here, we have to enjoy doing something exhilarating and useful without knowing for sure if it's going to work out. Another of my favorite writers, Wendell Berry, said, we don't have the right to ask whether we're going to succeed or not. The only question we have the right to ask is, what's the right thing to do? What does this earth require of us if we want to continue to live on it? The problem with hope and despair, like optimism, pessimism, is that there's a certain kind of future orientation built into them. And what I find, I'm one of the members of this new Ecodharma Center we have in Colorado, and we teach Ecodharma retreats. And what we really find is essential, and to be honest, I think it's true for all of us, it's so important to distinguish despair from grief. Despair is a head trip. What's going to happen? What isn't going to happen? Grief is something we feel right here and now. And indeed, we need to feel it. I think often we're afraid to feel our grief because we fear we're going to be kind of blown away by it. But I'm reminded of a monument in downtown London that I came across, a monument to 9-11. And all it said very simply is, grief is the price we pay for love. Grief, too, has a pair, and it's love. And if we repress our grief, what we find is, in a way, we're repressing our love. And it's really essential, then, and an essential part of our Ecodharma retreats. At a certain point, we share, we share our grief and anger and fear about what's happening. Right? I think all of this points to the deepest meaning of non-attachment to results of don't know mind in a world in crisis. And simply, it comes down to this, I think. Our task is to do the very best we can, not knowing if anything we do is going to make any difference whatsoever. Have we already passed ecological turning points and civilization as we know it is doomed? We don't know. But the fact that we don't know is okay. Of course, there's intention. We are strategic. We try to do the very best we can, but we cannot control the result. And one way to say it is that what we do ecologically, to address the ecological crisis, what we do is our gift to the earth. And like any other gift, if we give a gift because we expect something in return, is that really a gift? A gift is given freely, without attachment, and that's the challenge to our engagement, whether we can learn to do that. We don't know if what we do is important, but it is very important for us to do it. And in part because it's part of our own personal practice of individual transformation. Of course, to act in this way without attachment to results is setting the bar very high, right? The reality is most of the time we are going to have some attachment, but this is where the other side, the engagement, the individual practice, the meditation comes in. That even when we are feeling attached, even when so maybe together we try to do something that's really important, maybe, uh, well a variety of things. We try to do it and we're not successful. Uh, okay, we're disappointed, we're frustrated, but we have this practice. We can go back to the practice. The practice encourages us to let go, 
let go of this individual disappointment, but also in the larger context of the bodhisattva vow, that we continue to do the best we can forever. That's just the way it is. That's how we want to live. Our job is not to be perfect, but to do the best we can. And frankly, it seems to me, to be quite honest here, if Buddhists today don't want to do that or can't do that, then I think maybe Buddhism isn't what the world needs right now. But of course, I've tried to show that within the Buddhist tradition, there are a lot of things that can help us. Yeah. To help us respond to respond appropriately to the greatest challenge that humanity has ever faced. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, thank you so much for this lecture. Um, for the coming half hour, uh, we would like to uh, invite two people to the stage to actually reflect on your lecture um, and have some, ref well, I'm very curious, reflections and some questions perhaps, some, some comments. Um, um, and then um, I will open the, the conversation to, to you. And please share your thoughts, questions. I mean, uh, I, I was sitting in the front row and somebody said, this is one of the best teachers in the world. So there's a teacher in the room and you can ask him anything. So use that opportunity. Um, and we will have a conversation. I'll try to moderate it as good as I can, but feel free to share your thoughts, concerns, questions, uh, and post them to, to you or to the other people in the panel. I'm gonna introduce them. They are actually, uh, for me, they're Dutch teachers. Um, but, of course, there's, there are also academics and writers of books. But for me, they are really teachers. The first is Arjo Klamer, and he's a visiting professor of humane economics at the university here in Amsterdam, FU. And his book, Doing the Right Thing, uh, introduces a value-based approach to the economy. Um, he's also the, the chair of uh, the East-West, uh, the Philosophy East-West uh, Network. Um, so welcome him. Please welcome him to the stage. Are you a A true teacher. And it was really funny because at the end of your speech, actually, you were saying that. I mean, we just have to do the right thing without expecting the results. And he was like, yeah, that's my, that's... Yeah, so he was really enthusiastic about that quote. The second person is um, also a teacher of mine. Uh, of me. Um, his book Thrive, Fundamentals for a New Economy, was published last year. He wrote that. He, com he was the editor with Shinta Osterwal, and he put, collected many inspiring thinkers on a new vision of e on econ e the economics of, well, e economic theory. Um, he has a, he's, he's a lecturer here um, in, uh, in, in, in Rotterdam, here in the Netherlands. Um, and he is thinking about what is purpose economy in this day and age and how can, um, well, other thinkers in economics but also other practices actually help us overcome these amazing crises we have to deal with in this age. Give him a warm welcome to the stage. Kees Klomp. Yeah, three teachers on stage. Um, Arjo. As a chair of uh, Philosophy East-West um, and a professor in humane economy, what is what what is humane economy? It's what uh, David is talking about. <laughs> he is a humane economist. Yeah. Oh my God! Now you're an economist <laughs> suddenly. Now, can you explain a bit? Yeah, it's sort of uh, it's very much in in the line of what uh, what David talked about and the few re references that you made to the economy. See, I was trained as an economist, and I was told that uh, the basic assumption is of human behavior is that of greed, self-interest, uh, that people always crave for more. That's a basic assumption, which is also the basis for the idea of scarcity. And that's why we have markets and prices and all that. And as uh, what David told us, 
is that that is one of the, the dukkha, the sufferings. Um, and humane economy actually starts just from yourself, people, and to be aware that you are part of, as David also told us, of a greater whole. You're part of nature. You are nature. You are part, not just an individual, but you're part of all. And the basic question to ask yourself, and that's also I ask you and you, is what's really important to you? And humane economics, and actually that's what most people practice in their daily life, is trying to realize what's important to you. So friendships, family, we talk some about uh, karma, uh, but that's what's really important to you. And all that, what economists tend to talk about, is not irrelevant, uh, without all the stuff and all uh, what we do in the work, um, of course, helps us to realize what's important to us. But think of it just like that, that it is instrumental and not the purpose. And that's also what you were talking about, what happens if, uh, if you listen to economists, and that's also the question I, I would like to ask uh, David, is um, um, it's, it, I was reminded of the relatives that you were talking to. So if I go to, after this talk to, to mingle with my fellow economists, then I have the experience that you would like to uh, uh, realize uh, when you were talking about relatives or when you were talking about the bankers uh, to whom, with whom I talk a lot too, is that there is actually an, um, a great confusion. And I, sort of, I struggle with that uh, because uh, there are very few real, I think, economist colleagues in this room. Are there economists in the room? Can you out yourself? Yeah, one, one two. Thank you. Um, but that um, there is an, a real disconnect. And that's also actually, um, is that, that's what I struggle with. Uh, that, uh, a disconnect between what and what, or who and who? The way who, David or? talks and the way my colleagues talk. Okay. And there is like a, a wide gulf separating mm. the two worlds. Mm. And um, see, when I listen to you, I, I go along with you, by the way, I really appreciated the silence. I thought, and I think also, um, uh, let me also say that as, as a chair of philosophy, also East West, I, I thank uh, Peckhaus de Zwerger very much for uh, doing this and for you all to, to be present here and to make this happen, but especially for you to come and share your thoughts with, with us. But when I listen to you, I go along with you. Mm. Um, but then, I try to think what happens if I would like to share some of what you say with my colleagues. And actually, David was talking about that, because you can find enlightenment in your practice of Buddhism. That's right. In but what do you do? The actual challenge is to actually go out in the world. Exactly. And then what you do with all these insights you got today, yeah. you say, I'm really afraid of that. I, or. Yeah, and uh, you are dealing with that too. Yeah, you meet a lot of resistance. Uh, you are naive? Yes, very, very naive. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. I mean, so I, your I question today is... The beginner's is, mind. Do you, uh, is how do you deal with that? Yeah, how do you deal with that? That's what I want yeah. to get to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> do you already have a, a, an inclination to, to, ha to answer that question? Or do you want to... I don't think I can actually answer it, no. but I'd like to just refer to a couple factors that I think influence uh, any any answer. And one of them is just to make the point that it's, f from a Buddhist perspective, it's, it's important to uh, avoid the kind of duality that treats the other person as an other, as an object to be convinced. It's really important to sort of feel that, you know, it's not that I'm right and they're wrong and they have to be enlightened. It, it's much more a case of opening up to their and being empathic with their total situation. Uh, from a Buddhist perspective, there's no evil people. There's uh, delusion, but nonetheless, we all have the same, you know, Buddha nature, and that's to be respected. That's one point because sometimes the the animosity gets in the way, and the um, yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah. maybe I'll leave it at that for the moment. Yeah, it's yeah. like compassion. Yes, yeah? for sure. Yeah. Uh, as, uh, in, in one word, yeah. yeah. 
when you were listening to David, um, what happened? <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Well, um, I've been uh, practicing Buddhism for more than 30 years. Um, and, 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 you know, David is one of my um, heroes, so to say. Yeah, so um, I went as a 21-year-old to Thailand with my uh, then girlfriend, now wife, and I came in contact with Buddhism. I had no intention to, be, to become a Buddhist, yet I went as a tourist and I came back as a Buddhist. Um, and then I started to shop around in the Netherlands for, you know, trying to find my Sangha. And uh, so I went to the Tibetans and the, the, the hardcore Zen, and none of it made sense because they were all focused on the Zendo to isolate practice from society. Yes, and Sangha, uh, David just mentioned that you could translate it with community. Community, yeah. And, and then, of course, I, I came across Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, engaged Buddhism, and later with, with, with David and Bernie Glassman and all the uh, Joanna Macy, who, who basically turned the situation around and said, you know, you, you take your practice out there. Yeah. And, um, and, that, and I, find, I find that really empowering also for entrepreneurs and people that are in business that you can actually use your business as a vehicle for uh, for doing good and create value in a uh, in a way that is you know in intentional yeah. and, I th and i and i think that has changed so okay. it's really empowering and so, so you've studied all these let's say um i will do it like that alternative schools in uh, in economic thinking or even mm -hmm. maybe eco thinking which have a vision on economy yes um and if you have to explain what the contribution of this engaged Buddhism is for understanding how we organize society and with that economy, uh, what is then the single most important point that Buddhism raises I, to actually have an answer to that search? I think the acknowledgement of entanglement. Entanglement. Yeah, interbeing. Okay, there is only, it's one, it's one system. Yeah. One system. We are one. Yeah, so I think, and therefore it also goes further, and this is something that Ayo and, and, and I have been discussed, that, that, there, that if you take economics, you, we have had an evolution in the last couple of uh, decades from neoclassical economics to environmental economics and also ecological economics. And, and, and I think Buddhism and a lot of the people, the folks that I curated together with Shinta in, in, uh, in the Thrive book, they go one step further. Uh, because ecological economics is based upon the acknowledgement that an economy is embedded in society and society is embedded in the biosphere. Whereas I think Buddhism shows that it's not about embeddedness, it's entangled. Uh, so there is no such thing as an economy. It's, it's delusional. <laughs> yeah. uh, and we treat it as very real. And there's a difference between real and true. <laughs> Uh, and I think that What's is... What's the difference between real and true? That something can look very real, yet it's, it's not necessarily true. So if you zoom out from outer space, economy will fade and ecology will stay. So if you look at the, the planet from a couple of hundred kilometers from above, there is no economy anymore. Ecology will stay. That's right. I think that is Buddhism. So so, and then for, I think, um, Arya, what I like is, I mean, you, 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 of course, are inspired by Buddhism, but you're not a Buddhist. Um, but you, you use the, the, the terminology quite um, natural. Uh, and you, and I, think, I think I want to talk about the idea, the idea of suffering, which is institutionalized. And you explained it by one of the three sufferings, right? Agreed which is institutionalized. You cannot blame it on the individual CEO anymore because the greed is institutionalized and the same with ill will um, um, and delusion. What, 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 if you talk to these bankers, you talk to the CEOs, what is your conversation starter? How do you do that? How do you discuss institutionalized greed? 
now, I do actually a whole series of conversations now with bankers. Yeah. Uh, mm. Quite a few you know. Um, also just the bankers. because we know them because of in the, in the newsletter, in the, in the news, yeah. they are in the news, yeah. Um, I start Not always personally. with their personal story. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So ask them what motivates them. Then they start talking about their father and their mother and what happened in their youth. That always gives them a different mindset. And then I ask them about their ideals. And guess what the ideal of, let me not say the name, but... But a famous the, banker. A famous banker. What do you think is the ideal of a famous banker? Um, do I have to answer? You can try. <laughs> Does somebody want to answer? Yeah. Wealth for all. Wealth? Wealth for all. Yeah. Wealth for all of us. They don't talk about wealth. The banker, do, the banker does not talk about wealth. Not about money. There's no, in the conversations I have, I just talked with a, a CEO of a big bank. He didn't, didn't talk about money. And they all talk about, and that is what they, if in deep down, what they really care for are, the, in a way, your uh, relationships. relationships. Mm. They care about doing the right thing for people. They care about. That's that's all what they deep down want. Yeah. And that's the point that you made, and you made too, is that's not the life they live. No. Yeah, because they live in a system that sort of denies that. That's what yeah. you talk about, uh, denies that, and that they are caught up in a system that is entirely, and you focused on that too when you brought in the CEO from the oil company, in a system of greed. Yeah. But that is, that's, and therefore, I think what, what the Buddhists say, it, this is really suffering. Because although they will yeah. not say that out loud, but that is really bothering them. Yeah. So your question to David was actually strange about how do I deal with these people which because I come I do. across. <laughs> huh? Yeah, my talk, I was talking about fellow economists, not bankers. Okay. That's a different story. Yeah, that's a different Interesting. story. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. A league of their own. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, I think another economy. Interesting, interesting. Uh, but then the question, of course, becomes, if it works for a banker, it probably works for the economist. That's true. But that's also an, an, a question that I ask to you. Just be honest. What are you thinking of when you think about poverty? And what are you thinking of when you think about richness? Okay, so... Few words, poverty, associations. Yeah. We are the one percent is one of the associations. Exactly. So that's about, okay, what what else? Poverty associations you have with it. No, Just no choice. No choice. Hunger. Hunger. Not n not meeting the basic needs. Faith. 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 Fate. It's a fate. It's um, I, I'm, I myself uh, grew up in a Christian uh, society, that is my, my community, but when there we talk about poverty, everyone grabs for the wallet. And we think the way to address uh, poverty is to donate money. Mm. Yeah. And that people think apparently that poverty is a matter of having lack of money and richness is having lots of money. Mm. But there we are already falling in the trap that economists have prepared for us and I think that you're quite right uh, to imagine that the economy is a matter of having money or not having money. And I think that's your point, is that if you zoom out, or actually I also think if you zoom in, because then uh, the same effect, then you find out that money is not really the issue. Uh, that when you ask bankers what's really important to, to them, or even economists, that's what I like to ask economists after they have gone on about money and be uh, uh, mm. gross uh, national product and so on. They say, what's really important to you? They say all the same, family, work. Um, some people say, uh, I am a tevu, a religion. And I say, wait a minute, that's not in your equation. Mm. How come that what's important to you, you don't count as part of, of people's well-being? There's a sort of disconnect. That's mm. how I try to get to them. I mean. Uh, okay. That doesn't change anything, I, to be honest, uh, because that, that's a moment of oh, insight. No, and then well, but 
We just uh, exactly. Yeah. We do the work. We just here learn. We do the work without attachment to results. That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Doing the Thank right you. thing yeah. without attachment to results. There you are. There I thought are. the biggest for me was engagement mm. without attachment. Yeah. That is a complex That's thing difficult. in my head. That combining that engagement, relationships, non-duality, without attachment to results or without attachment. Doing doing the right thing. Yeah. Without that at yeah. attachment. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's also quite quite painful that I hated economics. Uh, in uh, secondary school, I, you know, it was all calculations and formulas. And then I went to the university, political science, and we got economic theory. And I had a lecturer that started to talk about Marx and, and Keynes and Adam Smith. And, and if you look at all the, 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 the old economists, they all were, they had ideas of how a good society should look like. They're all they, humane they, economists. Yes, they're all humane economists. They, 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 it so, was not about formulas I, I, and, and measurements. Okay. And no, but I'm trying to like, like uh, uh, try to grab what we're doing at the moment. So being in the here and the now. So this work, this idea of engaged Buddhism, which you are such a uh, articulate teacher in, uh, so, uh, so how do you say that? So, in, you use beautiful words and beautiful quotes, and you bring us to the to to the place where you say, "Okay, let's try this, right? Let, let's try to use that Buddhist thought in engagement to, without results, uh, try to solve this major ecological crisis we're in." Because Chomsky is right, we are, in, and then you are on the page, and you're talking about economics, and you have dilemmas. And I'm thinking, what are we doing? What you are trying to do is get a systemic discussion mm. on the agenda of society, of politics, of banks, of CEO tables or boardrooms. Um, a systemic discussion. And, in, um, and you, you are trying to see how this Buddhist inspiration, which you are one of the people who are is offering that, is helping you to do that in the right way, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yes. that's what we are trying to. And for those who are not economics, they can do the same thing with their journey on creating the systemic discussion, the institutionalized yeah. greed, the institutionalized ill will in whatever institutionalized conversation you're entering into. Yes. That's, that's what we are trying to that's do right. here. Okay, I hope that that helped. I hope that <laughs> helps. Um, I ga, yeah. Ik ga, yes, thank you. I'm gonna say a goodbye to the people who uh, watch this uh, live cast. Um, uh, because now we are gonna give you the floor. Uh, and that is really chaotic if you're looking at it from home. So we always get comments about that. It's, we can't see who is in the audience and where's the camera shot and we don't have cameras like that. So I'm gonna say thank you for watching uh, to the people at home, watching it from a live cast. And we are now gonna have a well, a brainstorm, a conversation, hopefully, a meaningful conversation here with the audience in Amsterdam. Thank you so much for watching.